we're in Acts chapter 9, and like I've already kind of alluded to this morning, our, our main character uh, this week is Saul of Tarsus, uh, also known as Paul the Apostle. And we've already been introduced to him uh, previously in Acts chapter 7, verse 58, right? If you remember, Saul was the one who was consenting uh, to Stephen's death. He was keeping the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen. And he was in the synagogue, the Hellenistic synagogue of the freedman and in Jerusalem. And he's listening, and I'm sure he's listened to the compelling message, right? That, that Stephen is giving the, this Jewish background. He's giving the, just the kind of going through the, the different patriarchs of, of Jewish history. And that it really is a redemptive story, right? Leading up to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's what gets him killed. And, and so uh, those men who heard him, if you remember, it says they were cut to the heart. But they weren't cut to the heart in, in a good way. They were cut in the heart where they kind of closed their heart to, to Jesus and what he did. And so they attacked Stephen. They murdered him. And Saul is the one consenting to this murder, right? But it goes from bad to worse. Well, um, by the time we get to chapter 9, though, is, is the conversion story. I love Paul's convert, Saul to Paul's convert. You're going to hear me say his name interchangeably. Just know it's the same person, Saul and Paul, all right? And so we're going to see his conversion story, a story of his, um, his testimony. I love testimonies. And you're actually going to see him throughout the book of Acts. And, you know, uh, Paul or Saul writes several of the books of the Bible, and he continues constantly sharing his testimony, constantly. And I love that he does that to draw people close to seeing the life change that there is in Christ. And so that's what we're going to be going to kind of diving into this week. Um, and really, there's a, uh, one of the turning points in the book of Acts. You all, I know you've probably heard me say that every chapter, but this, this really is a turning point. From now on, the book of Acts is going to be dominated, really, by, by this guy named Saul. And he won't be in every chapter or every passage, but uh, the majority of the story from here on out is going to be about Saul and his journeys that he's going to go into after what we're going to read about today is conversion. And so before we dive into that, let me just uh, take this up in a word of prayer one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just, uh, Lord, I'm thankful um, that you're using me as a, in this way to, to share hope, Lord. Uh, Lord, as we talk about um, Saul's conversion, God, just help us see that, that, that it's a life change. It's, it's turning a 180, turning away from something, and it's obvious that you're turning away from that one thing and turning toward God. Lord, I thank you for his conversion story and, and the hope that it brings us, that there's no one too far away from God. If you can save a man like Saul, Lord, you can save any of us in this room. There's hope in that. And Lord, I thank you for that hope. Lord, I also want to pray that anything of me just falls to the ground. It's, it's forgotten. It doesn't, no one remembers it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. But Lord, anything of you, of your spirit, Lord, I just pray that you just penetrate the hearts. You encourage, you, you uh, convict, or whatever, whatever you need to do in each individual life here, Lord. I just pray you do it. Just take me out of the way and do that. And so, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's dive in. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus. So, he found, so that if he found anyone who was of the way, whether men or women, he might bound, bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, the last time we saw Saul, 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 that's weird. But anyway, last time we, we mentioned Saul here was actually in Acts chapter 8. Verse 3, right? And what did it say about it? It says he made havoc for the church. It says entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And he's continuing to do that here, right? And we read in Acts chapter 8 that he, there was this general persecution that was going on uh, beginning after this Stephen's martyr, after he becomes a martyr. And when I say in general, that it's happening to all the Christians, right, in, in general, Whereas before, it was really persecuting the apostles. There was Peter and John, and they were in front of this, this Sanhedrin and all these things. But now it's just like, in general, Christians in general, that's who they're going after. It's widespread. And so that passage that we just read in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, tells us that, that Saul was an energetic persecutor, right? 
that he loved what he was doing. He entered every house and he looked at for every Christian that he can find so he can throw them in the prison and even murder them. And so he wasn't, it wasn't enough for him to do it just in Jerusalem. That's where we saw him before. He was in Jerusalem. Just as much as there were people who were sent out, remember during, during that persecution, they, we saw that it was scattered to all these different nations. There was, we talked about um, Stephen being scattered, or not Stephen, uh, uh, Philip being scattered after Stephen's death. And so it wasn't enough for him to do this. And he wasn't an, an accidental persecutor, right? He, he did very purposeful in his persecution. He, you know, his goal was to find Christians that he could, and with the zeal that just boils over, like water boiling over on itself, that's how much Saul wanted to get the Christians and throw them into prison and to do these things to them. This is a, fan, a man filled with remarkable, I would say, hatred, right? I mean, he's, he's filled with hatred. As it tells us in verse 1, he's still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And so... He, there, this is not a good picture. And make no mistake about it, Saul hated the disciples of Jesus, right? It's pretty obvious here. And so he believed he was doing uh, a God a favor, essentially. He was doing good in God's eyes by persecuting the Christians, by doing this thing. He thought he was, he was doing it for God. And, and the reason why I want to emphasize this point is that when Jesus found Saul of Tarsus, Saul wasn't looking for him at all, right? Not one bit. He wasn't looking for him. And, and so, you know, I think sometimes, at least to a person's perception, that they, they spend a lot of time, you know, just seeking after Jesus. And, and according to their own perception, they find Jesus. In reality, it's Jesus finding them. But Jesus meets them, or, and they find him, and there's a connection there. And that's what happens in a lot of people's lives. I ask you to raise your hand right now. I imagine that you say, yes, that's how it happened. I was seeking Jesus, and he found me, and that's how, that's how it was. But that's not how it is for everybody, right? It, 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 there is other stories that I, I would say that is just like Saul, where you weren't looking for him at all, and he kind of hits you with a ton of bricks almost, like, I, like smacks you right in the face. As a matter of fact, maybe you were running away from God. Maybe you were just going the complete direction a different direction as fast as you could uh, you were fighting against him with everything that you had in your life you know and 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 Jesus just shook you just totally shook your world up and it is something dramatic happening God met you even when you weren't looking for him that's what happens to Saul that's exactly the situation that Saul is in you could say this that that Saul was decided against God but God was decided for Saul I'll say that again. Saul decided against God, but God decided for Saul. And I think that's, that's amazing. That's great. And I think that we need to consider, even this morning, maybe you, you're not saying with hatred, maybe you're not saying with bitterness, but you know what? Maybe you decided against Jesus. Maybe, maybe that's you. You haven't completely committed to him the way that you should. And, and you, you don't want to be his. You don't want to be his follower. You don't want to surrender. That's a hard word, surrender. You don't want to surrender your life to him. And let me just say, I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad that you're here. So, but, but let me tell you, it may be very well that even though you're not looking for him, that Jesus is looking for you this morning that he wants to speak to you and, and speak to your heart. And are you going to answer that call in your heart? Because that's the Holy Spirit right there, just convicting your heart or doing whatever it is, and you have to respond to it. And so maybe you just need to wake up to the fact this morning that, that hey, he's looking for you. He wants you to see him, all right? And so we're enthralled with this man named Saul, right? You've already heard me talk about him well before he even was mentioned in the book of Acts here. And that's because he's going to dominate the rest of the book of Acts. And, but we need to be clear with something right, right away. That this is Saul before he becomes Paul. Now you may hear me say that interchangeably, but this is Saul before he becomes known as Paul. And here in, in Acts chapter 9, this is before his conversion and it says here in verse 1 that he is so energetic in persecuting Christians that he went to the high priest. He did his persecution work under the direct approval of essentially the highest pri the priest, high priest of the highest uh, form of authority that there is at that time. And so as it says, tells us in verse 2, it says he, he received letters from this high priest authorizing his mission. 
and to go to Damascus and throw the Christians into prison and, and maybe even kill them. And what I find very interesting is the mention of this high priest, because as I was studying for this, um, it just actually this high priest here, mentioned here in Acts chapter 9, is the same high priest. Uh, his name is Caiaphas. And it's the same high priest spoken of in the Gospels who was seeing over Jesus's, uh, when he, Jesus' trial when he was in front of them. And also when the apostles, earlier in the book of Acts, it's the same guy. And what I find interesting about this Caiaphas guy is that in December of 1990, uh, they discovered an interesting archaeological artifact in Jerusalem. And it's basically this, this ossuary. I think I said that right. It's basically a bone box. It's a, it's a box for bones. And what they would do is they, they would put somebody in a tomb, and it, they would let the, bo- like the, the body decay, and it would decay pretty fast. And so the body would decay, and then they would put the bone remains in this box, this ossuary, and so they can lay someone else in there. And then they repeat the process. And what's interesting about this, uh, this Caiaphas guy is that they discovered, they discovered the remains of a six-year-old man and then there's an inscription on it that said Caiaphas, right? And, and so many researchers, and, 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 I'll say, and I'll say this, there's no way that you can actually, you know, absolutely know for sure, but many researchers say that and believe that this box that they found was actually the Caiaphas that we're talking about here, this high priest. And what's interesting about this is that it just reinforces that we're talking about real people, real places, and, and things like that. You know, I, I, and I hope that when we see that, and, and I'm telling you things like that, that you just understand that our faith isn't a blind faith. You know, a lot of people will say, you know, you, you just believe in a God that is just blind faith. No, it's not blind faith. We read stuff like this and, and read things in Scripture and how he, he, he uh, fulfilled prophecy and all this and just reinforces for me, and I hope it does for you, that our faith isn't a blind faith. It's a faith of substance. There's so much that goes into it that we understand. Yes, this is true. This is why we understand it. And this is just one of those things that I could take and look at it and be like, okay, this is real. These are real people. These are, these are real things that, that are happening. And so th- our faith is not a faith, a, bl- a blind faith, but a faith of substance. Now, verse 1 tells us again that Saul, he's still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, Right? And so Saul is an energetic persecutor, and and allow me to read a couple of passages actually from the New Testament, because we know that that Saul uh, wrote, or Paul wrote several books of the Bible. Uh, We see his story through Acts, but he also wrote letters to other churches. And and so he actually writes about his time as a persecutor. And the first one here is in Philippians, a book that he wrote, Philippians 3, where he made mention of this background. Let me just read it to you. This is starting at verse 5. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. And he says, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, blameless. In other words, if you want to know how zealous I was about, about persecuting Christians and about all these things, that's, that's how, that's, I was completely zealous about it. I I thought I was righteous. I was blameless according to the law, right? And here's another passage he wrote in Galatians 1, uh, 13 through 14. Paul added this regarding his background. He says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries of my own nation, being exceedingly, exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father." Of my father's. And so you see how committed to this he was, right? He really didn't like what they were. He was sold out. He was totally sincere, totally committed, and was totally wrong. He was totally wrong. Friends, I'm just telling you that by today's measures, in the midst of so many people, as long, there's this thought that as long as you're sincere in your religion and what you believe, then, that, then that's, that's okay. That, 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 that's, that, that's, what, that, uh, that's all that matters, right? I mean, I'm sure you've heard that. You've heard your colleagues and, your, and people say that to you. And, and Saul of Tarsus, he was a highly educated man, right? And, and, and thought that Christianity was both wrong and deceptive. But let me tell you, that's just the wrong way of thinking. It, it, it's, it's possible to be sincerely wrong just as Saul of Tarsus was. He thought that he, uh, that 
that it was wrong. He thought that Jesus being preached, that they, they preached that he was risen from the dead. He said, he's like, no, he did not raise from the dead. He's dead. He's dead. Right? When they claimed that Jesus was God, Saul and other people like him said, no, that's blasphemy. You can't say that about Jesus. He, he's not God. When they claim that there's forgiveness for men, that man sins because of what Jesus did on the cross, Saul of Tarsus would have none of it. That zealous in it, just, oh, I can't believe they're saying that. I, mean, I, gotta get, I gotta stop this, right? He thought that Christianity was wrong. He thought it was dangerous. He thought that, that he was doing God a favor in persecuting the Christians. And so I just need to say something here, and, and it's something that should be said. Um, I'm just going to say it. It goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that, that Christians should never persecute or hate other people, right? Can we all agree with that? Christians should never persecute or hate other people. Now, when we look at the history of Christianity, there, there is a lot of shameful examples in, our, in the Christian history, right? Where there's been shameful examples when Christians themselves have been the persecutors of others, when Christians themselves have been the source of hatred toward other people. We see that in our church history. It's something that, that we're not proud of. And, and, but don't get me wrong. We are to put forth our message. We are to promote Christian ideals out into the world and continue to tell people. We're going to do that more and more and not less and less. And, and Lord willing, more boldly and not less boldly, we're going to present our message, right? But we're never going to do it out of hatred or persecution, let me just tell you that it makes all the difference in, in how we present ourselves. And, and it's just my view, and, and I imagine that some of you in this room might have the same view, but, but I'll give you what I think. It makes it especially difficult knowing that in, the, in, the, in our modern world, no matter what we do, we're always, Christians are always going to be looked at as people who hate other people, right? And, and I, I, it's, it's just how it is. There will be people who accuse Christians of hating other people no matter how loving we act. And so that's something for us as believers to, be, first of all, be aware of. We need to be aware of that. And so the truth is, hopefully, in your life and in my life, that that's a lie. That that's a, that's a lie. That people said that what people said about uh, Christians, it's a lie. And listen, our solemn responsibility before God is this. Our solemn responsibility before God is to make sure when people say that Christians are, are hateful, Christians are persecuting other people, make sure that it's a lie in your life, personally. Make it personal. In your life, make sure that that's a lie, that Christ is shared in love and care for the other person. Well, obviously, Saul of Tarsus didn't have that mentality toward what he believed. He thought he was doing God a favor in bringing violence and imprisonment and all these things. In some cases, murder against the followers of Jesus in the first century. So much so that it says in verse 2 that, he, that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them and bound them to Jerusalem. Now, you might have noticed something in verse 2. It, 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 it says uh, the way, that Christians is referred to as the way, right? Now, I find it very interesting because it seems that this is the first way uh, that Christianity was referred to in the early church. Actually, they, they didn't call themselves Christians like we do today until later on in the book of Acts. We're actually going to see when, when that first appears in Scripture. But, but Christianity was referred to them, Christians referred to themselves as the way or the followers of the way. And so if you hear the way, just know that it means they're talking about the Christians, the believers in Jesus, right? And so five times in the book of Acts, uh, Christianity is referred to as the way, all right? And so Paul, he's, he's going off to Damascus to find Christians who are there and, and to per persecute them. Now, let's see what happens on, on the way. I, I think most of y'all probably already know, but let's read it. I said, as he journeyed, this is verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I think this is just an amazing picture, isn't it? 
uh, somewhere outside the city of Damascus, this suddenly happened. Do you notice that word there? It says suddenly, right there in, in verse 3. And so they're, they're just carrying on. They're, they're on their way to Damascus. And, and nothing really unusual about this. Well, I take that back. There is something very unusual about this. I mean, he's going to Damascus to persecute Christians. He's going on his way there uh, thinking that he's honoring God by doing this, by persecuting the Christians. But then suddenly something happens. And what happens? A brilliant light shone from heaven, and he heard an audible voice of God. Isn't that amazing? And it's just amazing. I mean, and let's face it, that event is regarded as unusual, right? That's unusual. God usually normally doesn't confront sinners with a, with a, a light like this and an audible voice from heaven. But he certainly did with Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And by the way, that, that light was so bright that it actually tells us in Acts chapter 22, where he's, he's, giving, he's giving his testimony, and he tells us that this happened in the middle of the day. He says midday. And midday is when the sun is the brightest, right? It's bright, and, and, and yet Saul, I mean Paul, Saul, Paul, whatever, he said this in Acts chapter 26 about this light. He said it was brighter than the sun. Can you imagine that in the middle of the day, and something even brighter comes and, and, and blinds you, essentially? I mean, can you imagine what that would be like? I mean, I don't know if you've ever gone out, like been inside, maybe you're studying all day, and then you step outside in the middle of the day, and it almost takes you aback. You're like, whoa, like I, the first, my first instinct is put my hand up and block the sun, right? To, so my eyes can adjust. And, and, and maybe, a, and I'll, I'll not admit, I've never been knocked down by the light. And, but that's essentially exactly what happened to Saul. It says he fell to the ground. And Saul's reaction was simply to fall to the ground. And, and, and I don't think it was a falling to the ground in honor of God. I, I don't think he, he fell to the ground saying, oh, Lord, I want to honor you. I think he did this because he was scared. I think he did this because he was, it was a reaction of survival. He, he thought, oh, man, this is so bright. I got to get as far away from this light as I possibly can. So he got to the ground. And so he's thinking, I got to do that. I, I, he's terrified. He was so overwhelmed by this brilliant light that he couldn't stand in the midst of it, and he fell to the ground. And then verse 4 also tells us that he heard a voice, right? And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I find it interesting. There's, uh, there are oftentimes when Jesus is speaking to someone, or, when, or I guess I should say when he's speaking to someone, just that this heartfelt appeal to them, he'll say their name twice, right? He says, Saul, Saul here. And that's when he wants to give this heartfelt appeal to somebody, he would say their name twice. We've actually seen this um, previously in the book of Luke when we were going over this. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, right, in Luke chapter 10, when Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him, and Martha was out doing all the busy work, and, and Martha complained and said, hey, she needs to be helping me. And she said, Martha, Martha, right, and tells him, no, she's exactly where she needs to be. She, she is doing the right thing. She's doing good, right? And that was just a heartfelt thing. Martha, Martha, come sit. Be with me, right? Type of thing. And, and, the other, and another gospel, in Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus looks over Jerusalem, and he looks over the city with this great compassion and stirring in his heart, and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And that's when he talks about the hen and wanting to put them under his wing and how he wished he could do that. And so here, he's expressing this deep moving of his heart, and Jesus calls Saul's name out twice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so as this heavenly light was overwhelming Saul, he was confronted with the true nature of his crimes, right? I mean, think about this. He was persecuting people. He wasn't persecuting people. He was persecuting Jesus, right? Friends, this is just remarkable. Why are you persecuting me? He said, me. And, and you can just imagine someone like Saul being like, no, I'm, I'm not persecuting you. I don't even know who you are. I'm persecuting this person, these people over in Damascus. They're, I'm getting after, I'm after them, not you, I, whatever. You know, but you can just see how closely Jesus identifies with us, with his, his, his people. You persecuted them, you're persecuting him. I think that's just amazing. And, and I think about that as it closely identifies, he closely identifies with his people. And, and honestly, you know, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about Father's Day and, 
And I don't know why I was thinking about Father's Day, but I, I like Father's Day. I'm a father. I like it, right? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a great day. But you know, Father's Day is not great for everybody, right? It, it can be a tough day for some people. So maybe, maybe someone has a problematic relationship with their dad. Maybe that problematic relationship is still going on with their dad. Or, you know, maybe their, their, their dad w- was with them last year, but they're not with them this year. And there's just this, this pain and void that's going on in their heart. Well, can I tell you that, that Jesus loves you? If that's you, Jesus loves you, and he wants to comfort you because he identifies very closely with you and your loss. He identifies closely with us. That's what I want us to, to take from that. He identifies closely with you as an individual, right? And so to persecute one of his followers is to persecute him. To, to the sorrow of one of his followers is his sorrow. Their joy is his joy, right? And so that's how closely Jesus identifies with his people, so much so that he would call out, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And again, Saul, I thought he was serving God with his vicious attacks on Christians, but discovered that he was fighting against God. That's not a great place to be, fighting against God. And friends, this is a a sad truth throughout much of history. Many times, those who think they're doing God a favor are actually oftentimes the the people that are persecuting the most and and doing the most damage. I mean, we see it in in our own generation, right? People who honestly believe with their heart that they're doing God a favor and they're practicing violence and doing what Saul does, the havoc for the church on, and they think they're doing it on his behalf, but it's not on his behalf at all. God would say, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? Right? And so we we shouldn't only emphasize the me in this phrase either, right? We emphasize the me, but there's a very legitimate emphasis on the why part too, right? Why are you persecuting me? Saul, why are you being doing such a futile thing? Saul, why are you, I'm enthroned in heaven. I'm the one with this heavenly light. I'm the guy who knocked you to the ground. And, you know, and, and, and it's just Jesus, it says in verse 5, uh, tells us that, that Saul, after this, he says, Who are you? Who are you, Lord? And then Jesus says, I am Jesus. The Lord says, I am Jesus. By the way, did you know that Jesus was a fairly common name back then? Yeah, and, and I think it's interesting that, that uh, Saul didn't go, Which Jesus? Which one are you? Are you Jesus from, from Bethlehem or Jesus from, you know, whatever, right? He didn't have to do that. He knew exactly which Jesus it was. The ascended Jesus of Nazareth needed no further identification. When he said, I am Jesus, Saul knew exactly who was speaking. And I think about this. In, in all probability, Saul heard Jesus preaching in Jerusalem. Right? In all probability, Saul of Tarsus was on the Sanhedrin when, when Jesus appeared before them. And so this was no hallucination. This experience was absolutely life changing because to this point, Saul of Tarsus earnestly believed that Jesus, number one, was not God. And number two, he believed that G- Jesus was dead. And now having this experience, for Jesus to speak to him in this way, not in hallucination, not in some fairy tale, but in real life, it proves, number one, that Jesus is alive, right? Even though it doesn't really say this in the text, we can almost imply this by by Jesus' presence here. Where Jesus says to Saul, how dare you say that I'm dead? I, I am alive. I'm speaking to you right now. And I think it's also implied here, and definitely not said, but implied, how dare you say that I'm not God? I'm speaking to you in this heavenly light right now. I'm alive. I am God. Saul, you are wrong, wrong, wrong about me. Right? That's what he was. He was wrong. But I will say this. Saul does something right in the midst of this. Look at verse 5. He says, who are you, Lord? Who are you? Then he says in verse 6, he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Right? And I I think those are two great questions. These are two questions I think everyone should ask in their life. Number one, who are you, Lord? That's verse 5. And number two, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, most people, most everybody has questions that they would like to ask God. If I, if I got you to raise your hand and ask, well, if you could ask anything to God, what can you ask him? I bet there would be a lot of, a lot of questions, right? 
Matter of fact, there was a survey back in uh, 1990, a survey taken where people can ask uh, God a question. And, and they were asked to do three questions that they would most like to ask God. And they did this survey, and here's the top five responses from that survey. Number one, will there ever be lasting world peace? Number two, how can I be a better person? Number three, does the future hold, what does the future hold for my family and for me? Number four, will there ever be a cure for all diseases? Number five, why is there suffering in the world? Now, I, I don't think those questions are bad, I think, but, but I do think it's fascinating about these questions is that all of these questions in some shape or form can be answered in the Bible. You can look at Scripture and find the answer to these things. Just open up your Bible, and the, and the answers are there. And I think Saul's questions are much better. And you would ask God two questions. Ask him what Saul asked. Number one, how, who are you, Lord? That is admitting that, hey, maybe you don't know who, who God is. You don't know who he is. That, and he needs to show you who he is. He needs to reveal himself to you. And so it's amazing how people can be so confident in their own opinion about God. Well, you know, what do you think about God? Well, I think he's this and that. And, and so why do you think that, oh, that's just what, what, I, what I think he is. That's the kind of what, what I hope he is, or that's the kind of uh, what I want him to be. And, and I think about that, and it's like, so you created your own little God, right? You just kind of molded God and how the shape and form you want him to, to be. And, and friends, we got, we got a technical word for that in the theological world, and, and that's idolatry. Idolatry. And idolatry is essentially making your own God, right? That's idolatry. And so one that agrees with, with your point of view, that's the kind of God we have in our mind, is that he agrees with my points of view and, and, and what I want him to be, and, and that's, that's the God that we have in our mind, oftentimes, I think. And so let me just tell you, that's fine, unless, unless there is a real God enthroned in heaven unless there's a real God thrown in heaven that is revealed, like revealed to us in Scripture, which I believe is exactly so, that there is a real God. And so our job isn't to say, well, this is what I want God to be. That's not our job. Our job is to come to the Bible and say, well, uh, God, you tell me who you are. You reveal yourself to me. Who are you, Lord? We ask that question with a, a humble heart. And we realize that if we want to answer that question most perfectly, you know where you can look? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Jesus came and perfectly showed us the nature of God, right? I mean, Jesus reveals who God is. So, so if you want to know who God is, then I want to encourage you, read the Gospels. That is, that is Jesus' life on earth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the Gospels. You know what? When you're done reading it, read it again. And then read the rest of the Old Testament and read the, the New Testament. But... but if you get out of your comfort zone, I think, you know, I think it's important that we do that, that we look at the Gospels and look at Jesus. That's how we figure out who he is, as he reveals himself to us as we read Scripture and, and, enter, and, and, and hear about him at church and things like that. But there's also that second question that Saul asked, right? He says, what do you want me to do? Well, what do you want me to do? And I think that scare, that's a scary question, right? Oh, what if he asked me to do something that's out of my comfort zone? What if he asked me to do something that, you know, or stop doing something that I love to do? Or, you know, what, what if it, he, whatever he asked me, what if it's not easy? What if it's something hard, right? That could be a scary question. What do you want me to do? But you heard me say this a thousand times, and I'll say it again. This, and I hope that the Spirit of God just impacts your life and your heart. He cares for you. He, he loves you. And anything that he asks you to do that, that isn't easy, uh, you can just trust that he, it is good for you because he loves you so much. I hope that, that that encourages your heart when you go through hard things, that God loves you. And he loves you so much that he's going to, even though it's not easy, that he loves you and he'll be with you and you'll get through it. This too shall pass, as, as, as the old saying goes. And so we can honestly ask this question, what do you want me to do? And have faith that his ways are higher than my ways, right? That he knows better than I do. And, and notice that Saul's question is also personal. He says, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And I think that's important. 
to make it personal. You know, I think oftentimes we're interested in what God wants other people to do, right? This is what God wants you to do. But it's also important to just surrender our hearts and just say, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's what a surrendered heart asks. Lord, what do you want me to do? Make it personal in your life. And then notice something else here. I don't know if you notice it. It's, it's kind of a strange phrase here. First of all, he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And then he says this kind of, kind of strange phrase. He says, Is it hard, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, interesting here, when Jesus says that, uh, a lot of people consider that a, a small parable regarding Saul and his life, right? Uh, the goad is like a long, sharp stick that you essentially you poke an ox in like its hind leg, and you try to poke it to get it to go the direction that you want it to go, right? And so if I wanted to go left, I'm going to poke him, and then I'm going to direct him, and he's going to do it because he doesn't like that poke of the goad, right? And so essentially, Saul was the ox, right? Saul's the ox. Jesus was the farmer. And so Saul is stupid and stubborn, like an ox. And yet, he was valuable and potentially extremely useful to the master's service. And so Jesus goads him into the right direction, and the goading causes Saul pain. And yet, instead of submitting to Jesus, he says he's kicking against the goad. He's like, get out of here, stick. You're bothering me. But it won't stop, right? And so it only increases his pain. And so it's not... Too much to say that if we, uh, you know, don't ask ourselves these two great questions and obediently listen to God's answer to these questions, that we're acting like a stupid ox, right? I mean, I'd, I'd hate to compare you to an ox, but, but, and you might think that's an unfair comparison. And I agree, that's an unfair comparison, but not to us. It's an unfair comparison to the ox, right? I, I, I think we would owe the ox an apology, because the ox has never rebelled against God like we have. But I think we could say the Spirit of God was working on Saul, right? He was also something goading, I believe, at his conscience. Despite all his outward confidence and his zeal and all these things, there's something bothering him inside. I mean, could you just imagine you're consenting to, to Stephen's death and they're stoning him, and then you hear him say, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Man, I can just imagine just like how, how that would affect a man like Saul. But notice also that Jesus knows how hard it is. He, says, he said, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. It's hard for you. And let me just say, I love that about Jesus, that he knows when things are hard for us. Like, I just think that's, that's amazing. This shows us this just how great the love of Jesus is, that he, he was the persecuted one here. He was the, but yet he was concerned with how it was affecting Saul and his life. I think that's just amazing. He knew that Saul was fighting against something, fighting against the truth. And so you can just imagine his, his response to all this. It tells us right here. He was, tem he was trembling and astonished. The fact that Saul was trembling and astonished by all this reminds us that this is not always pleasant to, to have an encounter with a heaven like this so dramatically. Saul was terrified by this experience, not oozing with, you know, warmth and gushy feelings like, like we often, you know, think we, we have when we have an experience with God. It wasn't like that with him. And so there's Saul. He's blinded by this great light from coming from heaven, undoubtedly shutting his eyes tight. And, and yet Jesus still appears to him and speaks to him, even in this blinded state. I don't know how that worked, but he appeared to him even in that blind state. And he, in this encounter with Jesus, Saul learned the gospel that he would preach for the rest of his life. It's just beautiful. He insisted this in Galatians 1, 11 through 12, that the gospel uh, which was preached to me, he says, is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and, I, and I think about this, and it all started with this. Lord, what do you want me to do? I think it starts with that. And notice when Saul asked this question, Jesus didn't tell him the, the whole picture. He didn't tell him what to, what to do. He just told him what to do in that moment. 
He didn't tell him, oh, Saul, I'm going to use you, and you're going you're to proclaim Christ, and you're going to write all these books. He didn't tell him all that. He just told him, this is what he said. He said, arise and go into the city, and you, be t- and you will be told what you must do. Let me just say, that is often the characteristic of, of God that, that in, our li- in our lives. He directs us one step at a time. One step at a time. And I think it, he does that for very specific reasons. He doesn't tell us the whole plan Because oftentimes we knew the whole plan and how hard it was going to be, we wouldn't do it. We would chicken out. He knows we can't handle it all at once. But I also think that it's as we take these steps, he reveals a step, we take a step. And as he reveals the steps, we continue to take a step. And we learn as we take these steps how to trust God. Because he's faithful in every step. He really is. So if if you haven't stepped out in faith, I encourage you to do that. Take a step. And then you'll see that he's faithful, and you can take another step. And every step you take, you just see more and more how faithful he really is and how much he loves you and how much you can trust him with every step. And so that's what Saul had to do. Look at verse 7. And then Saul, and, and, I'm sorry, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. So he's blind. And then they led him by the hand and brought him to, into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, I think this is fascinating, that, that people were traveling with him. I, I think that's fascinating. Obviously, they were just as committed as he was, right? That's what they... That, it, he was, he was their team. That was the, their part, his partners. You know, we're going to Damascus, and we're going to get those Christians. We're going to persecute them. We're going we're to fix this Christian problem that we've been having. And seemingly, none of this that happened to Saul had any impact on his companions. At least we, we're not reading it. We, we don't see it clearly in, in Scripture. And yet Saul opened his eyes, and he couldn't see. And, and, and I don't know if, if this was merely a physical reaction to a bright light. I don't know if it was combined spiritual and, and physical thing. I just know what the text tells us. And when he opened his eyes after this heavenly light, he couldn't see. And in great humility, he had to be led to the city by these companions. Now, is that the way that Saul and his companions were planning on going to Damascus? No. Right? You you can almost hear God say to Saul, listen, Saul, you know, you shut your eyes to my light and and my Savior. Now spend a few days uh, as blind physically as you are spiritually. You can almost almost picture God saying that to him. Because he's three days, it says, without sight, nor eating, neither eat, and neither ate or drank. Now think about this. It seems that that's, it's not that he couldn't do those things. He could probably physically do those things. But he was so shaken by this experience that he was unable to, unable to drink for, and eat for three days. All he could do is just sit in this blind state and think. And, and, use, and, and, and I think this is a humbling experience for him. I can imagine in those three days that God is just working in Saul deeply within his heart. I mean, just challenging everything he thought he knew, right? I mean, think about it. You thought I was dead, Saul, but I'm alive. You thought that I wasn't God, but I am. You thought the message of the Christian was wrong, but it's right. It's true. You see, Saul had to learn how to die to self. He had to learn to die to his old life before he could actually learn to receive this new life from God. In those three days of blindness and not eating or drinking, Saul was dying to himself. That's what was happening. And after those three days of dying to himself, I don't want to spoil it for you, but next week we'll actually see it, that Paul is is converted. He he receives the resurrection life from Jesus. And we're going to get into that next week. But can I just close with this thought? I just keep thinking about his companions, right? It's amazing uh, experience that Saul has, and, and, and these guys that were with him, it's right there in verse 7. It says, men who journeyed with him, right? They were right next to the same experience. I mean, think about that. 
They heard something from heaven. They saw some kind of light. They didn't see what Saul saw, but they saw something was going, around, going on. And maybe they even fell to the ground too. I don't know. But they seemingly had, were not persuaded at all or converted at all. And, I, and, and so what does that tell us? It tells us that you can be very close to Jesus. You can be very close to his work in someone else's life and totally miss it. And totally miss it and receive it for yourself. And, and so I read that and I think, what, what's happened to those guys? Right? Like, I, I don't know. What, did they ever? I, I don't know. I mean, they could say, yeah, we were with Saul uh, on the road to Damascus. And yes, something happened. What happened? I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. It was very strange. Uh, it, it, they never received by faith what they could have because Jesus was just as real for them as he was for Saul of Tarsus. And so in closing, I, I'm just going to give an invitation this morning to anyone, anybody here this morning. If you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ, you want to put your faith in who he is and what he did for you on the cross, and, I, and I'll just give you, do it for this reason. I'd hate to be someone to be like these friends, these companions, where you just get so close to the things of Jesus. You're hearing about Jesus, and we're preaching about Jesus, and maybe you see someone, Jesus, doing something in someone's life, and, and it's, and it, but you're never trusting in him for yourself. Let me just say, close is not enough, is it? Now's the day to put your trust in him. Now's the time. Yeah, and so we're going to pray. And during this prayer, I'm, I'm going to do a moment of silence. And you can, I just pray that you, just, you, if you haven't done this, you can give your life to Jesus and say, yes, Lord, I know that you are the Son of God. I believe it. I know it in my head, but it goes from the head to the heart, and I know it, and I trust it. I want to change my life for you. You can do that this morning. And so let's close in prayer, and then we'll have that moment. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, first and foremost, I just want to thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for the, your power and the reliability of your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you're still changing lives just like you changed Saul of Tarsus' life. That you haven't stopped doing that work, but you're still doing it. And Father, we're so grateful for that. Thank you that you've changed lives in this room. Lord, I pray that you would extend that power to us right now. I pray that, that all across this room, Lord, that, that we would realize that you've been after us. Maybe they haven't been seeking you at all right now, but Lord, I pray that you would just speak to their hearts about who you are and that you've been seeking after them. Lord, I just pray you would open them up now in response, respond in faith in this moment of silence. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your grace extended to us through Jesus. Thank you for the lives that, that you seek even to this day. Lord, help us to humbly ask, who are you, Lord? Help us to stop kicking against the goad. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, Lord. Lord, just have our hearts say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And just trust you more and more every step we take. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.